morning. This subject is not strictly concerned, and I like the annotation or sound description as such, but with trends observed in relation to practical genetic training, um, and in particular to learning cardinal vowels. Having taught the subject for over 30 years, for the past decade I've also been engaged in research into practical genetics, and this paper represents a few of the findings from that research. My presentation begins with a brief introduction to the investigation itself, um, and then summarises three selected findings. First, perception of individual cardinal vowels, showing that some vowels appear to be more readily learned or perceived than others. Then what I call the height adjacency problem, where we'll see that the majority of errors made by learners involve confusion between adjacent pairs of vowels on the openness continuum. And finally, we'll look at what I'm calling dominant and dominated vowels, where we'll see that within each adjacent <coughs> pair of vowels, one member tends to exert an influence over the other. I'll end with a few concluding remarks, summarising the relevance of the various findings. Introducing the investigation itself then, first let me quickly describe the context of the study. This was carried out as part of the regular teaching and assessment cycle, collecting data over a five-year period. It involved a heterogeneous group of 125 undergraduate subjects, diverse in age, language background and gender, typical <coughs> in fact of your average class mix in UK universities. Their unifying characteristic was that they were all ab initio students of phonetics and were to study the subject for a full academic year, including 24 hours of practical phonetics training. The data reviewed here focuses principally on responses to the eight primary cardinal vowels. Progress in mastering all sounds um, was tested twice during the year, halfway through after 12 weeks of study, all subjects took a test which included identification of 25 tokens of primary cardinal vowels. <coughs> 15 were presented in isolation, either as monophthongs or as part of a diphthong-like vowel glide, and you can see the test items on the slide. A further 10 tokens were contextualized in five simple <coughs> nonsense words. Again, you can see the test items on the slide. Subjects took a further test after 24 weeks in which all vowel tokens were contextualized in nonsense words, including four secondary values alongside the eight primaries. Secondary vowel data will only be of passing interest to us this morning. One of the first things to become apparent when studying the results of these tests is that perception of individual vowels varies. Some vowels seem to be much more readily identified than others. <coughs> Overall results for successful identification of primary cardinal vowel stimuli can be seen in this table, um, where it's immediately obvious that E and HU were identified correctly more often than any of the other values at 82 and 85 percent, respectively. So we've got 82 for E, 85 for HU. The next nearest are OR at 65 and A. If we move on to consider the meaning of these results, this is the ranking that transpires. We have highly significant differences in rates of success with the different vowels, and the likelihood of this ranking occurring by chance is absolutely minuscule, um, less than a tenth of a percent in fact, P being less than 0.001 by chi-squared test. The vowels also fall into at least four distinct perceptual groups. We have um, U, E forming one group, or A, the second, and there's no difference, um, no significant difference between the scores within each of those pairs, the differences between the pairs on this rank. Um, or E form a third group, and A, R, a fourth. <coughs> Interestingly then, we may have a situation which is at least partially explained by phonology. The extreme point, points of the basic e a vowel triangle, which is demonstrated to occur in some form in almost all language-specific vowel systems, are three of the four vowels most often 
identified correctly in the Practical Phonetics Forum. These are values which can presumably be described as having a certain familiarity for virtually all learners. They already have something against which they can match what they're being taught. Next, a closer look at the internal relationships holding between these various judgments reveals what I've called the height adjacency problem. This focuses on height adjacent pairs such as E, 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 etc., pairs where the only difference is one degree of height on the openness continuum. Except, of course, for R, or um, where you've got a concomitant to um, change blip position. Height adjacent pairs are thus distinct from extended height pairs, such as A, E, and so on, where there's a larger perceptual space between the members. In common with studies of the perception of actual speech, um, this investigation found that in phonetics ear training, too, the numbers of errors in height judgments exceeded those involving either backness or rounding. As you can see here on this slide, um, we've got 66% for openness compared to the others. This is to be expected, of course, to the extent that there are more choices available on the openness scale. You've got four degrees of height, as opposed to training two degrees of backness or rounding. However, in spite of this possibility, a chi-squared test confirms that the number of openness errors here, this whopping 66% that we can see in the middle there, compared with either of the other two categories, it's still highly significant. <laughs> To return then to the actual openness judgments <coughs> made here, the next slide reveals that the majority of wrong judgments involved height adjacent pairs <coughs> rather than extended height errors. In the matrix on this slide, for example, we can see that of the 500 responses to the E stimulus, 410 were correct, and the correct answers are on the diagonal, emboldened right through. 25 responses illustrated the height adjacency error, while only six were more distant in the shaded area, where you can see all the numbers are smaller, only six listeners made an extended height error when presented with the stimulus E. <laughs> um, each column of cells on this matrix uh, reads the same way and displays a parallel pattern. Taken together, 79% of all wrong responses after 12 hours of training are actually height adjacency errors. You can see, if you look at it, that the largest numbers are always, and these are mistakes, remember, they're always in the boxes immediately adjacent to um, the central diagonal representation of the right answers. Now, this tendency continued throughout the training period, so this represents the halfway point, but throughout the period, that continued, so that after 24 hours of training, the number of height adjacent errors compared with everything else still totaled to 72% of wrong responses. And if you factor them out, the pattern was also observed in responses to the secondary cardinal bars. Moving on then, these openness adjustments reveal a further interesting relationship between adjacent vowel pairs. This relationship extends to include not only the height adjacent pairs that we've just looked at, but also adjacent open vowels, front A and back R. It seems that almost always one member of each adjacent pair exerts a greater influence than the other, creating two classes of vowels that I've called dominant and dominated vowels. Um, I've presented these results and summarized these results, this relationship, in this final table. If you look at the figures here, it becomes clear that in each adjacent pair, one vowel features in the response more often than the other. It attracts the largest number of correct responses, and it features more often among the wrong responses when these are errors of adjacency. For example, in the first pair here, E, E, we can see that E is identified correctly 82% of the time, while E only gets a right response a little over half, to, half of the time. Moreover, while E is identified as E over here, um, in ten, over ten percent of all the responses, E is E is only identified as E in on two point four percent. Sorry, E is only identified as E on two point four percent of the occasions. So if you take those two.
two results together, you can suggest that the E is dominating the relationship there. And that pattern you'll find repeated for everything except the close back or all, where you get right responses to all more often, but who doesn't dominate in the confusion analysis. There is a remarkable similarity here, I think, to um, the perceptual magnet effect that's demonstrated by Kuhl and Iverson in their studies of real speech um, perception, and this is something which clearly would merit quite a lot, I think, of further investigation. By way of conclusion, then, um, I think the findings are interesting on two accounts. In practical terms, they inform us regarding some of the difficulties likely to be encountered by ab initio students when they learn the carbon file system. Information has implications for both the design of ear training materials and the structure and focus of practice sessions, as well as for assessment. In the wider field, they raise issues of the theoretical nature regarding speech sound perception, including questions about the nature of the model internalized by the learner when acquiring new sounds outside of a specific language context, carbon bars in this case, and then, of course, the relation of this model to learners' active real language phonologies. Thank you.